Aloha, Bailina Mai Me Ke Aloha Kako, Ovao O Ke Aloha Fox. I come from Hawaii with lots of aloha and gratitude to the university and its staff, and also to the fellow um, esteemed colleagues who are also presenting throughout the colloquium. Um, I am a biomedical scientist and my career started off in clinical psychology. So I hope to integrate biomedicine and social medicine in the talk today to help you understand the work that I've done through four specific research studies and a law that I passed in the government to help influence and improve the conditions for Native Hawaiians in Hawaii, which is our ancestral and indigenous homeland. I'm very happy and thankful to be here. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. I wanted to provide an overview of the abstract because I want to help situate the audience and the learners and the students that are new to what conditions are usually a part of the family, family violence constructs and what those definitions are. And then also link that to looking beyond the interpersonal and the individual and help look towards the, the systems that have eroded the structures of our families in Hawaii, which now we see in present day, many health disparities and social inequities that have persisted. Uh, and we have tracked and monitored through the data before I was born and before my parents were born. So I am part of the millennial generation where we have been trained uh, to no longer do research for the sake of research. And we do research that's translational and that is to impact two things. We want to help build community interventions that our community is asking for. So it's very participatory, it's very uplifting, and it's very positive. And the second portion is we are intending to influence policy change. We want to go to the very highest levels of the government and demand that our people have fair and equal access to resources, to expertise, and to the capacity that we need to change those gaps that we've seen over time. So I have a few learning objectives for us today. I want to introduce you to the Kukuluho methodology, which is a Native Hawaiian epistemological approach to the way in which I conduct my research, which we have published. Um, I want you um, to help, un help you understand what healthy ohana what healthy Native Hawaiian families looks like through our own lens and through our own worldview to help you learn about structural inequities and how those structures and systems place barriers and um, uh, influence and impede our progress as indigenous people. And then I want you to uh, help examine cultural perceptions uh, and beliefs around what healthy families look like and what does wellness within communities live like. Um, and then I use, I use a social determinants of health approach, which has been adopted by the UN and the WHO and has been adopted in the United States and also Hawaii. So I'll link that to you for uh, a policy approach. So some background to the research and the data is to help you understand first and foremost um, that family violence, interpersonal violence, gender-based violence is not a part of our history as Native Hawaiians. We have gone through um, uh, many oral histories. We've gone through our Hawaiian language newspapers. We've gone through the journals that were kept from the missionary time period. Hawaii, Hawaiians lived very healthy lives. This has been documented since Captain Cook and the um, voyagers came to Hawaii for um, uh, shipping purposes, economic purposes, and then later, right, uh, Christianity purposes. Um, we are a very thriving people, and when we think about our own health and well-being, we think about it in this construct, right? We think about it from the mountains to the ocean, and we think about it collectively. So if we talk about a person that doesn't fit and match our worldview, our health is dependent on the health 
of the people that we surround ourselves with, our partners, our children, our families, but it's dependent also on the collective community. This is a, a rendering of our Kauhale. So we lived in Kauhale and it's very dependent on the success of the environment because we believe we were born from the environment. So if our environment is unhealthy, then we are unhealthy. And so this is an ecological model of Hawaiian well-being. So I want to thank Professor Daviana McGregor, who is the one that helped connect me to the university here. Um, this ecological approach shows that the minimal level is looking at the health of Native Hawaiians. The maximum level of our health is when we know our islands are thriving. When our oceans and our streams are clean, then we as people are healthy and vice versa. This is symbiotic. You cannot have one without the other. If the family is unhealthy, then we as people are unhealthy. If the community is healthy, then so too are will our lahui be, our people. We call this concept balance. This is pono. So we are Kanaka Maoli. We are Native Hawaiians. At all times, our behaviors, our beliefs, our practices, our approaches must balance ola, what is well, what is healthy, what is life, what is quality, with ma'i. What is the imbalance? What is the disease? What is the disorder? We always stay here in this space. And so we have a traditional practice, which is part of my lineage, which I learned from my ohana in our kauhale of ho'oponopono. So before I ever went to medical school, before I ever treated other patients, I learned ho'oponopono in my own family. And they passed down these ancient approaches to pono, to balance, from them to me. I now pass it on from me to my son. I have a six-year-old. He goes to Ho'oponopono class with our kupuna, and he now will learn Ho'oponopono too. Because we know if we're pono in ourselves, with our environment, then our families can be pono. And this is our traditional practice, where before the sun set, every night, families would go to sleep balanced. We have three activities within the practice of Ho'oponopono. One, is pule, it's prayer. It connects us spiritually with our environment, with our aumakua, with our akua, all times. We have a process of mihi, of repentance. So before the sun sets and before the mahina rises, we mihi to one another. We mihi to our partners, we mihi to our children, we mihi to our aina. If we were, uh, if we misstepped, if we transgressed, we mihi, we ask for forgiveness, we apologize, and that's how family life always was, so that the discord didn't build over and over and over again, year after year, where then we saw real severe conditions. The last one I wanted to highlight is the hi'uvai practice. So we cleanse ourselves with our waters. What you actually maybe can't see so well because the light is very um, bright in here, this is actually a picture of your waters. Uh, so we went to uh, Mo'orea the other day. I took a picture of your water because your water is our water and we are your younger siblings in Hawaii. And so we honor the waters that connect us and as we think of the Sea of Islands, how that water can help to purify our people, right? So this is our cleansing practices. Uh, within our waters. And so we incorporate these three activities into Ho'oponopono. We have our own Native Hawaiian determinants of health that are um, sometimes similar and convergent with Western notions of health and well being and lack of disease, but many times are unique to what we only find throughout Polynesia. And so this is what my work focuses on. It's building the strengths and assets and the conditions which have always thrived among our islands, among our atolls and our archipelago, and to bring those back into the present day. I have a video I hope to show you of that, if we can get the internet connected. Um, so I wanna show you four of the studies that I have uh, worked on and published as the principal investigator. Um, but I first wanna situate you in the types of family violence we've talked about today, 
and yesterday and some that will be talked about tomorrow. This is the typical power and control wheel. This is what the United States typically looks at through a research-based uh, interpersonal approach, right? So what you see is uh, violence through physical and sexual forms. You see issues that uh, are main themes around privilege, economics abuse, coercion and threats, emotional abuse, social isolation, uh, denial and blaming. This is the typical power structure wheel. I want you to think about this in the ways in which violence has come up in contemporary ways in Pacific societies, because this is what I'm uh, proposing in, through this paper and the work that we're doing to adapt and modify. So now I'll introduce you to the Kukulu whole methodology and the framework. So this is a transdisciplinary theory that we've developed that is um, based off of Hawaiian methodologies, but I think could be generalizable and usable in other pa Pacific and Polynesian contexts. So we start in the blue column, the Kavamamua. So that's where we look at this historical and con cultural context of how Native Hawaiian well-being has always thrived. That's where we look at practices like the kauhale, like the ohana, like ho'oponopono. The second column in the red is the mo'ohihia. What is, what's that hihia, what's that entanglement that took us away from these cultural strengths and assets and moved us into the conditions of disparities and inequities that we're starting to see today? That's issues like colonization, militarization, capitalism, all wrapped up into a very short time period for our people. So not dissimilar to other Polynesian islands, during this Mo'ohihia time period, our land was taken away from us, our queen was illegally put into a jail, uh, we uh, experienced um, rapid, which is my area of specialty, we experienced rapid rates of infectious diseases where 93% of Native Hawaiians died due to these communicable diseases, right? So we living today, me, my son, my father, we are resilient in and of ourselves because we have continued to thrive and survive despite this mo'ohihia time period. We are living now in the green column, Keia Ao. These are those contemporary indicators of imbalance that we're trying to address now. Those are things like high rates of poverty, high rates of incarceration, high rates of chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes and cancer, but it also relates to where family violence is situated for us today. It didn't come here overnight. We know the progressions of what has happened over time to lead us to this point. What we're working towards in my generation, what I teach my staff, what I teach my students, is we're working towards the purple, kavamamua. What will the future look like for our people? We plan 10 generations out. In 200 years from now, what will our people look like? How will they thrive? How will they live well and long lives? And how can we address and eradicate these conditions like family violence that we see in our community? This is fully explored and um, addressed through a transdisciplinary plenary research approach in the book, um, Manalahui Kanaka. So you can access the book um, online. It's for free. Um, all of the appendices and the research methodologies. We have videos that interview uh, Hawaiian practitioners and leaders in our community about what is mana. How do we articulate the very essence and the power that we have as people to live and thrive in pono ways through the construct of mana? We are gonna only use our definitions, we only wanna use our approaches, and we no longer have a need to use the words and the qualifiers of the colonizers in the work we wanna do in our own homeland. So I invite you to look at the book and access the resources and materials. So, what is this Native Hawaiian cultural identity? So the, the middle in the red is the, our Kanaka Maoli self, right? At the highest form of who we are and who we can ever be is our mana. It's our spiritual power that connects us to our Aumakua, our Akua, our Ali'i, our Aina. Our mana comes to us in two ways. 
that which is inherited genealogically, generation after generation, and will be for 200 more years and plus, and then that which we acquire. That's through good deeds, that's through our education, that's through our community volunteering, right? So mana is the highest form of our identity, which is balanced through us as individuals to our pico. Our first pico connects us to our ancestors, our middle pico connects us to the present generation, and our pico ma'i from our genitalia connects us to all of our descendants who will come after us. All of this works at the same time to make sure we have a healthy and clear na'au, our seat of our emotions, the seat of our intelligence, and the seat of the kava mahope of what is possible in the future. We have our own cultural codes of conduct um, in our Hawaiian society, which still persist today. It starts at the very top level with our kuleana, our responsibility. We have an obligation to make sure that we address these conditions for our people and that we have an obligation to be good people. We have our mana, our spiritual power that I talked about. We have our kapu, right? This is our, our um, the exemptions that we place so that we do not overstep and we do not infract upon the land or infract on one another. We have our kanavai, we have our social laws that balance uh, the collectivity and the behaviors of the populace, of the lahui. And then we have places like our puuhonua, our sanctuaries. These are our vahikapu, these are our sacred sites. These are our um, heiau, our altars, where we can still go and visit and derive spiritual power and mana from. And so this is one of the quotes from the research. So mana depends on balancing pono and kuleana, that the foundation of our Hawaiian spirituality and the morality that we possess is consistent to this mediation, negotiation, the actualization of pono and kuleana in daily life. That's why we don't go to bed upset, right? We make sure that before the sun goes down and before the mahina rises, we are paying attention to what is pono and we are making sure that we are staying steadfast to our kuleana. So I come back to this, this, uh, this wheel of power and control and what family violence looks like. So I've minimized it because this is the typical Western approach. And then what our research is starting to look at is what happens when there is cultural abuse and violence, say, against our heiau and our sacred sites. What happens when there is environmental abuse and neglect, say, against our mountains and our rivers and our fresh water? What happens when there is spiritual abuse and violence that strip away our connection to the greater power that surround us at all times and balance our mana. So what we're proposing is that that power and control wheel, things like economic abuse, um, using children against one another for, um, to get back, to get revenge, that is so minor compared to the larger structure and system that has been oppressing our people for multiple generations now. And that if we're going to address these conditions, we have to look at the entire system and structure that continues to perpetuate violence against our people and our social norms and the future that we wish to exist. Part of this is captured in um, this report, so transforming the health of Native Hawaiian men and boys. This is Kane Hoalani. Um, Kane Hoalani looks at economic sustainability, education, physical health, the family, the connection to culture and land, and criminal justice and incarceration. You can access this report anytime, um, and the report is free to download, and there are also interviews and materials for you to access for your students and um, in your programs. And Kanehoalani is balanced by Haumea, transforming the health of Native Hawaiian women and empowering the well-being of Wahine. Same thing, we're looking at the overall well-being of women and girls through economics, through leadership and civic engagement, mental and emotional wellness, physical health, motherhood, and yes, interpersonal violence as well. And so I have some data to show. 
from these two studies. I want to um, be able to highlight how my work as a biomedical scientist uses population-based surveillance data and it's able to disaggregate to even five and six levels, right? So I have race and ethnicity data, I have gender, I have geographic location, I have age groups, and then I have the indicator and the condition that perpetuates these inequities. And so what you see here very clearly is these are our mental health rates um, by gender, by race and ethnicity over a 30 day period. The dark green is zero days, and then it goes up into 14 days. So what I want you to briefly see is the two bars, Native Hawaiian male, Native Hawaiian female, in comparison non-Hawaiian, in comparison to the state. So we have six cut levels of data that clearly indicate here that Native Hawaiians have the highest rates of mental unwellness within a 30-day period, 14 days or more. And you can see the statistical significance between the comparison groups. Another area um, in the intimate partner violence and family violence um, uh, work that I've done and the, and the data that I've analyzed, same thing. Um, so what is the rates of intimate partner violence in Hawaii? So this is um, all genders combined. So you see Native Hawaiian versus non-Hawaiian and you see the total population with the estimated count and then you can see if we just pull out the females, how much of that is actually gender-based violence against women. So very easily, statistically significant, Native Hawaiian women experience more interpersonal violence compared to non-Hawaiians in Hawaii. Uh, here, what you can see is we've been able to take this data and disaggregate it by uh, age groups. So you can see 18 to 29, 30 to 44, 45 to 59, and unfortunately, we have very poor data monitoring and tracking for our kupuna for our elders. This is an area of gap and concern where we want to make sure we are tracking elder abuse within our community because our elders are our hula kupuna. They are the most precious treasures and they're the most precious feathers within our people. So you can see here, uh, for instance, among Native Hawaiian women, 45 to 59 years old, you can see that there's almost double the rate of inter intimate per personal violence, um, IPV, among adult females compared to um, non-Hawaiian females. Um, this is uh, um, uh, population rates for those uh, Native Hawaiian women versus non-Hawaiian women who experience unwanted sex by their partner. So same thing, statistically significant among our females, Native Hawaiian women experience higher rates of unwanted sex with their partners. This looks at incarceration rates of Native Hawaiian women, and so I just want to show you real quick, the darker bar is non, this is a total women, and then the lighter bar is the non-Hawaiian women. So this is where the data granularity and the data set is very important to when you do your research, because unfortunately here in this data set, Hawaiian is in the dark column. So what is actually happening is we're pulling up the rates, right? Uh, and so you can see very clearly, especially among the Makua age, the adults, um, we have very high rates of Native Hawaiian women who are incarcerated in their adult years, which means they're not with their children, they're not with their grandchildren, and that they have been removed and dislocated from their ohana and their kauhale, which leads to a lot of social cultural issues. Um, I have pulled the um, rates among our high school students, our OPO, and our youth. So this is an area that we want to actually intervene and prevent. Um, so we have really good, I have very good data. And so what I've been able to do is not only pull the percentage rates for you, but I can map them for you through a GIS system so you can see a heat map so we know which islands have the higher rates. So if we wanna design a very specific intervention, we can actually target an island. So for example, um, this is the Native Hawaiian high school students who have been emotionally controlled by their partners, right? Starting with a very specific level of acuity and it, this data will build. And so you can see one in three Native Hawaiian students are experiencing emotional abuse starting in high school as early as ninth grade. 
We're actually seeing this in middle school already. The level of acuity goes up when we look at those that have been physically abused. So you can see now with the heat map, it's changing, right? So it doesn't mean that these conditions are identical as the acuity and the severity increases. This is why disaggregated data is so important to not make assumptions when we want to design interventions. And then the next, the highest level of, of that acuity for our community right now is looking at the high school students who are forced to have sexual intercourse as early as ninth grade. Um, so we're seeing uh, fairly high rates, more than one in 10 on uh, Hawaii Island. This is the island that is, uh, has the active volcano. Kilauea is actively erupting. So what are we doing about it? Through these reports, we've been able to have town halls and community meetings and meet with leaders and decision makers to design cultural solutions. So for our kāne, with relating to our kāne hoalani report, this is an example of the uh, ukulele building workshop. So this is three generations of kāne here working together to learn the cultural practice and through that, the kupuna is helping to guide them in the norms and the beliefs and the practices of kāne from one generation to the next. And so it's been very powerful because this is an approach to using interventions as a way to connect back with our culture. Okay, let me somewhere. We're doing the same with our wahine. Through our Haumea report, we're building community development solutions through the Aha Wahene, and we're starting very young. So these girls here in the middle, they set up an economic um, engine and driver in their community, and what they built is um, uh, bows and headbands, and they sold them at the community fair at one of the schools. These are seven-year-old girls, and they're already learning the power of being a woman who owns her own business and makes her own money. These are the type of interventions that we're supporting. But we're also looking not just at Western notions of what well-being looks like. We're building, we're rebuilding the land, and we're getting our women to connect spiritually and ancestrally to the Aina. So through these uh, recommendations, at the core is good collaboration. We want to create policies for justice and racial equity. We want to frame our programs through traditional values and approaches that relate to positive Native identity among Hawaiians. We want to utilize research and data and evaluation from our programs to help inform decision makers on what is empirically supported and what is a best practice. And we want to strengthen the intergenerational community approach between our kupuna and our keiki, between our elders and our children. So recommendations. One, if you're conducting research and evaluation in this area of family violence and gender-based violence and interpersonal violence, there is so much importance placed around data availability and the quality of the data set that you're creating and the database that you can use in order to run analyses with specific granularity at the level that I have with my data sets. But also making that data and research accessible. Everything that I've showed you here, I make open access free at all times to anybody around the world. This is why I'm a translational researcher, is because this information is the community's information. These are public dollars conducting this research. Then it belongs to the public to know exactly what's happening and to make informed decisions of what type of interventions they want to see in their own community. And that data integration is so important amongst these um, uh, transdisciplinary conditions. We cannot talk about early childhood education if we don't also talk about occupation in the industries in which these children will go on to work. We can't talk about occupations and industries without talking about the gender wage gaps and how women, Native Hawaiian women in Hawaii are paid $20,000 less than men in Hawaii, year after year. That's more than a million dollars across their lifetime. Imagine how many women that is, and their keiki that are unfortunately impacted by those types 
of systems that are working against them. So the data integration is key, which is part of what my research does. It looks much more holistically. The second area for intervention and prevention recommendations has brought together a group. We are called the Native Hawaiian Health Consortium. We're Nalimahana Olono Puha. We are a consortium of private, NGO, community health centers, community-based providers, the government, and academia, all working together with a strong cultural-based foundation of who we are as Kanaka Maoli with strong indigenous-based science and methodology. We are effectuating three tiers for our intervention, the tertiary level, the secondary level, and the primary level. We're working from programmatic implementation to state and community level to federal policies and national initiatives uh, through federal entities. And this is helping us to improve our Native Hawaiian health outcomes. The third level of recommendations is around policy. So I utilize a social determinants of health approach, which shows that things like type 2 diabetes is only one portion of what happens with our health, right? Health is so much more. It is about the food that we eat, the education that we are provided, the work environment and conditions we live in, unemployment rates, water and sanitation, and this goes back to that socio-ecological model for Native Hawaiian well-being. It's pretty similar, actually, and so we've made a lot of gains, and so I wanted to highlight the bill that I wrote. Um, into law a few years ago. So that um, utilized a social determinants of health model through a health and all policies approach, which you'll see through the sustainable development goals adopted by the United Nations. Um, and so what this act does is it has made that all um, state agencies in Hawaii, so this could be the Department of Education, this could be the uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources, this could be the Department of Transportation. They have to take a lens of social determinants of health when they're doing their plans uh, for their governments. That could be their strategic plans, that could be their tactical plans. What is really exciting about this is when this law passed, um, we introduced it uh, and passed it in 2015. You know, I was, um, I was really young, and I didn't know what policy level, systemic level intervention could do. I'm, I'm trained as a scientist. I did not go to law school. I do not have a political science background. What has just happened is now the state is requiring that every state agency that provides health care to anybody in Hawaii, including Native Hawaiians, including Pacific Islanders, they have to use this law as part of their uh, intervention planning to the level of um, uh, $2.5 billion is now invested into this as of September. And I can tell you, if you're a student in this room or if you mentor students, believe in them and their capacity to make change. My mentor believed in me and my health attorney. We weren't even 30 years old when we introduced and passed this law. And now $2.5 billion of money for the United States is going to come and help our people in the interventions in ways that we want to by addressing the Native Hawaiian determinants of health. I have references. I have my contact information. This is very fast. This is four studies and a law all put into one. Um, and I want to, if I can, I would love to show you the video because it helps to explain how we've incorporated very sound research into our decision-making capacity through this, um, uh, the HRS Chapter 226.